All right, everybody. <clears throat> uh, welcome to Pioneer Bluffs. Thanks for being here on our uh, Where the Buffalo Roam event. Um, we're going to start off with a talk from George LaRue, who uh, is a man of mystery. I just met him today, so he's going to kind of introduce himself and let you know some of his background and uh, talk to us, I assume, about some skulls. So. And lots of bison stuff, hopefully, too. Uh, so I just want... Oh. First of all, my name's George LaRue. I live in Alta Vista, Kansas, which is north of here by about maybe 50 miles, right on Highway 177 on the way to Manhattan. And I have been blessed by the Great Spirit to have been able to work with many animals in my lifetime. I'm a professional wild animal handler and trainer. And I started at Sunset Zoo, where I got to work with tigers, uh, grizzly bears, sloth bears, spectacle bears, chimpanzees. Uh, I moved on from there to work at Rolling Hills Refuge with, Refuge with many endangered species. I helped design and build Rolling Hills Chimp and Orangutan building for them and took care of their rhinos when they first got them and got to train rhinos and lay on top of a rhino every morning and kiss him on the face and tell him how special he was and caress him and he just loved it. He ate it up. Um, being a wild animal handler, I've gotten to handle lots of critters and train lots of critters and make lots of animal observations. Uh, when it comes to critters, they are very intelligent. And uh, the bison are among them as very intelligent critters. I found I can only outsmart my bison once if I'm trying to do something with them. And then if it doesn't happen the second time I try to do the same thing with them, they're like, no way, I'm not cooperating. Uh, they are very intelligent animals. Um, I started my bison reserve in 1996. I don't consider myself a bison rancher. I have, I have 200 acres of wildlife area, unbroken prairie and prairie that's being restored. And I have about 60 bison that reside there. Um, I've done nothing to try to domesticate them. In fact, bison really resist domestication. They are a wild animal. They are not someone's 4-H project. Bison is a herd animal. It is all about the herd, and it knows that. And part of its dynamic, in socially speaking, is about maintaining the herd and its structure. So what's kind of unique about the bison um, is that it is a matriarchal group. The herd is led by the girls, and the sisterhood stays together. And if you were to take a picture of a bison herd, many times you would see mature males on the outer edge. You would see some young males hanging together. And then you would see most of the cows in a large group. And in that large group of cows, you would see calves that were born this year. You would see yearlings that were born the year before. And you would see two-year-old females and three-year-old females and the girls stay with their moms. The sisterhood does not break up. Um, typically what happens, if we start at the beginning, bison are born in the springtime. Most animals birth in the springtime. They don't birth in the wintertime. So uh, they tend to be born right as the spring grasses are going to summer grasses. Uh, first of May through June. Those two months in particular. Sometimes you see some stragglers in July. Sometimes they come a little early at the end of April. So if we follow them through the seasons, um, those calves would be with their moms uh, the, first of, the first of May. They would suckle for about six weeks to two months, and then they start to turn brown. When they're born, they are the color of Irish setters. They're like Irish setter red, and that red color on the green background of the grass growing makes them very invisible to most things. Uh, I always found it amazing. People would look in the tiger exhibit at the zoo and say, why don't you let the tiger out? I'd look down there and I'm like, he's right there. And they couldn't see him through the stuff that was growing in the zoo because he was slinking down and staying low. And baby calves are that way too. Bison calves out in the field are very hard to see when they're laying in the grass and the grass is green. Those moms will form a nursery with those orange calves. And all the moms that have dropped new babies stay together in the center. And with those moms 
are possibly yearlings from the year before, or two-year-old females, or three-year-old females that have not given birth for the first time, and are learning the sights, sounds, and smells, and organization of the herd as it happens. They stay that way because when baby bison are born, it takes them a while to get their legs under them. So it might take 10 minutes for them to get to their feet for the first time. But for, in my estimation, somewhere around seven to 10 days, all they do is toddle behind their moms. They get up, they, they scamper, they lay down. Because they're toddlers, they don't know how to run yet. But when they hit that seven to 10 day mark, they will do zoomies away from their mom and come running back as fast as they can. And they will take off and they'll circle around outside the herd and then they come running back as fast as they can. And, and then they do that several times that day. And that's them stretching their legs and learning to run for the first time. After they've gone through their day or two of zoomies, they have the ability to run and keep up with the herd. So part of the bison female group when they make that nursery area is keeping an eye on all those toddlers because they don't really have the capacity to run from a predator. And they are protected by their young siblings, those two and a half, three and a half, or two year old, three year old females that are with their moms, watching and smelling the sights, sounds, and smells of giving birth, and how they all organize together to protect themselves. Now those young females will go address a coyote that walks to the field. They will take off and run that coyote off or any dogs that might approach the field or back in the day, bears and cougars and wolves, which were all part of the prairie ecosystem and part of what the bison supported on the prairie. Um, those, those, uh, those females have not given birth yet, so they are just about full size and can run as fast as anything out there. Zero to 35 miles an hour in about five steps. That's five steps, not five seconds. It's like one, two, three, four, five. And they are on full, full bore. I, I learned this firsthand just the other weekend when I got charged and had to run for my life. I was much farther away from the shelter I thought I was that I could run to. And when I was starting to pull up thinking, I was done running, she was still coming, so I had to keep on going. Uh, and so, uh, no matter how you think you are doing with a bison, they can be unpredictable. In fact, someone was killed last year here in Kansas trying to put his bison back in. Um, so you have, this, you have this matriarchal group, you have the mixed ages of females throughout this group, and in that group, there is a dominant female. And bison have a couple different pri priorities. Uh, their priorities are, it's time to graze because we're hungry. It's time to lay down and ruminate. It's time to go to where the mineral salt is and get some, some minerals in their body. It's time to go to the pond and hang out. It's time to um, go to the dust wallow and take a dust bath. Uh, one of the things about the bison and why they are a keystone species for the prairie is when you live on the top of the plains, when you're up on the top of the hills, there is no water available. Water is in the valleys. Water are where streams are at, or where the river's at. And back in the day, there were no ponds to drink out of. So as they cross the prairie, they make their dust wallows. Their dust wallows are integral to how the prairie develops, and, and the bison are integral to the prairie itself. They are the Johnny Appleseed of the prairie. They eat stuff. They digest the seeds, they deposit those seeds in their dung, their dung becomes topsoil, and the grass regrows from that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize the bison eat grass, but there are all kinds of grasses on the prairie. And the grasses come in a succession. And so you have spring grasses that emerge right after winter, and they green up and they go to seed. Most grasses and flowers, the bison can eat and digest, especially if it's green, which is like everything. Um, they, can, they can eat all that stuff, but it changes in its flavor and its texture as it matures. So as a grass goes from leaf matter, where it's taking nutrients out of the soil and robbing the limestone of calcium, which makes it really it rich for the bison's milk, um, it will then uh, put up its seed stem 
flower, be pollinated, go to hard copy, makes a seed of itself, it either drops or is planted by the bison. The bison can get nutrient value of, uh, from that plant up until a point it goes to hard copy. In hard copy, it doesn't get a lot of nutrients from it because the seeds will pass through its system and be deposited. But in flower form, and up to flower form, it gets plenty of nutrients. Um, so it will eat the spring grasses. Then uh, when the summer grasses come on, they come in succession also. And uh, four of the main grasses that you'll find in Kansas are little blue stem, big blue stem, uh, Indian grass, and switch grass. And they don't do their thing at the same time. They move along. So I'm just going to give an example of an order. Uh, little blue stem would be the first one to go to seed. And as it goes to seed, it moves to the switch grass. And then when it goes to seed, it moves to the Indian grass. When it goes to seed, it moves to the big blue stem. And so they're constantly changing their diet on the buffet as it moves through the season. And then late in the season, the summer grasses stop their production and the cool season grasses come in for a short period of time and in some ways stay semi-active under snow cover and throughout the winter. And the bison, of course, are meant and built for dealing with winter. So as they come into the fall and the diet changes, they start putting their hair and coat on for winter. Um, these critters were around as the glaciers retreated and, re and allowed grass to be uncovered and area to be uncovered at the end of the last ice age. Uh, the prehistoric bison had a, a horn span of up to nine feet and was a stoic animal, meaning it really didn't run from problems, it addressed them. <laughs> Where the modern day bison is very fleet of foot and has acquired a, a much more running in a herd tactic to avoid being predated by the bears and the cougars and the uh, uh, wolves that were on the prairie and the Native Americans, the first Americans. Um, the bison have uh, proven their success over time until, until humanity overpopulated and started destroying habitat. Habitat loss came in a number of different ways and worldwide habitat loss it's the number one cause of extinction on this planet. Once there's a building there, those critters can't live there anymore. And it's that way everywhere. It's that way in Florida with the Everglades. It's that way in California. It's that way here in Kansas. So the habitat destruction comes as progress, as we call it. Right? So habitat destruction came with just people displacing the animals that were here with the bison, including the bison. The, uh, the railroads during the middle 1800s that wanted to connect the East Coast with the West Coast, the Civil War was over. Um, the Native Americans uh, gaining horsepower, literally being able to ride horses, was part of the bison's downfall. The railroads paid people to go out and kill all the bison. There were 60 million of them at one estimate. Bison, as far as the eye can see, and Within uh, 18, at the end, uh, middle of 1855 or so to 1895, they were all but gone, down to as few as possibly 200 animals in the wild and a group of about 200 in Yellowstone. Uh, those numbers are all approximations that I've gotten from other information sources. Trust me or don't trust me on that. It was low. These animals barely escaped extinction. There were some people standing up for them in 1875 or so, and there were some things that happened that helped keep them from going extinct completely. Some people who cared and tried to make something happen. There were probably 20 or so, that, and they all had very different motivations. Some of them were very selfish, some were very altru altruistic. Uh, either way, it saved the population from crashing completely. One of the organizations was the Smithsonian Institute that helped organize something to save and round up some of the last wild bison. The fact that they could even, the idea that you could round up the last wild bison shows how small their numbers had gotten. Uh, the Bronx Zoo was another that stepped up and started one of the first species survival plans to, to save an animal and possibly find some habitat for it. Um, but that was a very new thing, and looking back, it was really 
primitive in their ideas and ideals of how they thought that would happen. But they did achieve some success doing it. Um, we were lucky that we had a president that at that time, Roosevelt, who was an avid hunter, um, thought we needed to save some wild spaces also. And when he was approached about saving the bison from being the last bison and becoming extinct, he helped make the national park system happen in several places that gave them a place to go. And then there was a reintroduction of bison back into areas where they had not been. At my house, I play a small part of that because I reintroduced bison back to the prairie in Alta Vista where they have not been for 150 years. And it was theirs before it was mine. And it's not really mine, it's theirs. And it will be theirs again because I will end up leaving my bison ranch to my bison and hopefully in the care of a wildlife organization that will allow them to continue to perpetuate their own in that space over time. One of the laws of nature that we deal with with bison is that um, for every one sacrifice, the rest get to go on in time. And that's the way it's always been. As the herd was organized, uh, there would always be animals that were falling to the outside. So the most dominant female gets to be the dominant female for quite a while until she doesn't have the chutzpah anymore to hold her own against other dominant animals. They push each other around and test that dominance over time. And so when that old gal can't be the dominant female anymore, she'd be on the outside of the herd. She'd be the last one to the watering hole, the last one to use the dust wallow. And if she were not feeling healthy, she would be even a little separate from the herd. And those are the ones that the bears and the wolves and the uh, uh, cougars could possibly take down. And they would eat on that animal. When they were done, then the next critter would eat on it. Say the bear took the, the old cow down and then the uh, wolves would eat on it after the bear left. Then the Native Americans would scavenge whatever meat they could off of it. Then the foxes, the possums, the coons, uh, the badgers, the skunks, um, all these other critters that are meat eaters would have their turn, the eagles. And then you would uh, uh, have a bone pile left where that animal had deceased. And then during the winter time, the voles, the field rats, the pack rats, the, uh, all the gnawing animals, porcupines, groundhogs, um, prairie dogs, all these critters would gnaw on those bones and get valuable calcium that was built up in the bison system from eating the very, uh, very calcium-rich grass that they ate all their lives. And those communities support the snake community and the owl community, and it, it all comes around that the bison are woven into this web of life and all the strands are really connected. Uh, one of the things that makes uh, a bison what it is, is its horns. Elk, another prairie animal which we don't see which should be here. Sorry, one more time. Moose, yes, absolutely moose. Uh, te Texas law, no domestic animals please. Uh, uh, so deer, so how many types of deer do we have? Can you name them? Mule and whitetail, good job. Uh, so, I'm sorry? Any? Pronghorn, thank you. And she didn't say pronghorn antelope. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, any other animals? Caribou, very good. Up north, there are a couple of them. Think of another one up north? Bighorn sheep, yes. Mountain goat, thank you. Musk ox. And uh, let's see, you guys have gotten, oh, okay, so one that's not common, there's, a, there's another type of deer in the United States down in the Florida Keys, they call the key deer, and it's smaller than most deer. Um, and uh, everybody gets a failing grade for not saying great horned owl. Uh, no. Uh, owls don't have horns. And I'm going to put out there right now, there's no such thing as a jackalope, okay? And if we think a little smaller, the Texas horny toad, but he doesn't really have horns. So bison have horns, right? And the other thing we, we were talking about are antlers. This is a set of elk antlers, another prairie animal that should be here on the prairie that has been displaced, not out of love and kindness, 
but because we're here and we don't want it here with our stuff. Um, so there are a few places in Kansas you can see elk still, but this is magnificent. So an elk weighs up to a thousand pounds and antlers are shed, right? So what happens with an antler is it grows off the skull and it is covered by a velvet that has little blood capillaries in it and it helps grow this big bony structure and when it gets cold out, those capillaries dry up and it rubs off its velvet, same with deer, it rubs off its velvet and then you have the bony structure left and they use this during mating season to perform and outperform other competitors in the area to mate with females. Antlers get shed at the end of the season. They break off at the base of the skull and, uh, and they're left behind and they grow this huge structure again every year, which must takes a lot of energy, must take a lot of eating to make that happen. If they damage the velvet, it doesn't grow right. It's like the, it, it'll, it'll deform the horn to make it either curve or just not develop fully. Um, so when they have their velvet on, they are very sensitive to walking through trees and brush. They can feel it when they bump up against things. Once it's the bony structure, it has no feeling to speak of. But when it's in velvet, um, they're pretty sensitive to how they, they walk through things. And this is a lot to carry. This thing probably weighs, I don't know, probably weighs 20 pounds and would hurt you really fast. I hurt myself when I first got it, just getting it to the car. It poked me in the knee. And then as I turned around, I bumped something that poked me in the ribs and I put it in the car and I sat down and it poked me in the hip because it stood out just enough to get me. So these are horns on a bison. Horns are not shed. Horns are fed. If you look at this, it looks very spongy. There's a whole bunch of blood capillaries. And horns are alive. So when a bison breaks its horn, a couple things can happen. From what I've seen, mostly the females break horns because a lot of the nutrients in their body goes to making babies, not to growing horns, even though they use their horns. Many times, the most dominant girl in my group has a broken horn, and it's because she uses it. So they use their horns to break ice. They use their horns to dig the soil to get mineral. And they use their, their horns to compete or assert their dominance. Um, this is, was one of my big guys, and I'm not gonna hold it, but you can see I fit really nice between his horns. If he ever wanted to toss me, I could have really been tossed. What you don't see on him, is you don't see his big afro. You don't see the hair that was up to here that made his horns look small. And that's one of the ways you tell the maturity of a bull in the herd is how big is his bonnet? How big is his afro? This guy had a huge afro. And for whatever reason, as he decomposed on the field, this patch, this eye patch of leather stayed on him. And no, it's not for sale. Uh, but you can see the difference between him and the way a female's horns are set up. So when a young bull is born, his horns are little nubs their first year. As they move into their, uh, as they move from yearling to second year, they grow straight out. And as they hit two and a half, about this time of the year, they point straight up. And that's how you know your bull has gotten to that level of maturity, two and a half. That would be like the equivalent of a 13 or 14 year old boy. So this guy was probably closer to 11 or 12. And as they mature, the bull's skull develops a crown and the horns tilt slightly back and slightly down and they will curve again. Um, in the herd dynamic I have in my wild, hands-off sort of herd, um, what we see are, uh, we, we, we remove bulls from the competing edge of the herd. If you have too many bulls and not enough girls, you're gonna have bulls chased over the fence because they're too weak, or you're gonna have a lot of competition within the group, and things just get really hectic. So we limit the amount of bulls we have in the herd. I usually keep my best bull every year and I carry him for quite a while to see how he's gonna turn out as a full-size bull. The animals we take for meat, those are our young warriors. They are the sacrifice that allows the rest of the herd to go on in time. Um, 
those guys are always between two and a half and three and a half years old, except for the best guy, and I'll carry him forward. So I usually have a line of bulls that right now probably extend from about a 10-year-old bull and an eight-year-old bull and a six-year-old bull and uh, a couple of three-year-old bulls still. Uh, and then everybody that's younger than that that's a bull is either still hanging out with his mom or hasn't been called yet this year. Um, the horns, because they're alive, when they break them, they either reset and heal, or there's a bloody mess and it heals over and they have a nub left. It will continue to grow at the base of the horn for the rest of its life, but it'll never regrow the part that broke off. Um, let's see. White-tailed deer for size comparison. And uh, this was probably a nice sized white-tailed deer with a nice size rack. Uh, and he's really small comparatively. He's got antlers, so this would have had velvet that he rubbed off. Um, prong horns fall in between. They don't really meet the definition of they are a horn. They are alive when there's blood going to them, but they shed this horn. And if you look at it, it's really interesting because it looks like someone took some kind of resin and glued hair together to make this horn. Everybody's welcome to come up and take a look at this if we don't move it to the back where everybody can take a closer look at the things I brought. Um, I mentioned the bison are a keystone species. There are three that I recognize um, as keystone species because they are so integral to other species in that community. And that would be the prairie dog and the beaver. And the bison, the prairie dog, and the beaver all engineer their environments. They all do something that's integral. Prairie dogs bring flower seeds and stuff to the surface that have, that have been buried for a long time. They provide a place in a real large town where bison can go to escape a wild grass fire that's coming through and have been seen doing that. Go right to the prairie dog town and wait there and watch the fire go around. They didn't pack up against the fence and then get burned to death. That wouldn't happen anyway because a bison could jump a six-foot fence. So they would pretty much let themselves out if they had to. But um, back in the day, they would take refuge at prairie dog towns. Prairie dogs are, have an, like 125 different species of animals that are integrally attached to their prairie dog town for various reasons, including the black-footed ferret, which is an endangered species here in Kansas. So as you look up here, this is a prehistoric bison skull. This was found in the Kansas River, and it's semi-petrified. It sure feels like it's petrified up here, but it's also kind of brittle on the end. So this was probably a recent guy, you know, within the last 500 years or 200 years, was buried out there in the Kansas River, and he was found. This is an elk jawbone, not verified by me, uh, uh, found in the Kansas River also. At one time, we had a stag moose that lived in Kansas. We also had a prehistoric rhino that lived in Kansas. Woolly mammoth and mastodon also were here in Kansas. Uh, the, Kansas was a spruce forest at one time and has also been a desert a couple different times. Uh, so our big picture environmental swings happen in Kansas for sure. Uh, this is a bison vertebrae. And so of course, the spinal cord went through there and it was like that. So as a bison is designed, he's got that big hump on his front shoulders. And that is because it takes a lot of leverage to lift that giant head. It takes a lot of leverage to pick it up. And if you watch a bison run, first thing he does is kind of lift his chin up. He gets his front legs off the ground and pulls them up and his hind legs drive him forward. So what you have going on here is a big counterbalance between the tail end and the front end. And he's got to get it rocking. And you've heard people say, I'm sure, uh, reference to the prairie as a sea of grass. Well, if you watch them run, they run a little like dolphins swim. You see them do this with their head, this up and down motion and drive forward. Uh, rhinos are designed the same way. They've got this big massive head, this big massive horn. They don't have a big hump like the bison do, but they've got a big set of shoulder blades there. If you think about how the George Washington Bridge is designed, you have your bridge, you have two towers, and then you've got all these cables that make it a suspension bridge. 
And just like one of those towers giving support to the bridge that's out hanging in the middle, a bison is designed the same way. His shoulders give him leverage to lift that giant head. And they have power. They have real power. I've seen a video where a bison hit another bison. Is the, the bison he hit, his hind legs came off the ground, and he literally flew backwards. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea. I've seen my bison toss a bison that we've put down up in the air like it was a rag doll. Like a rag doll. And, of course, we're like, stop, stop. <laughs> um, one thing I've never really figured out for sure with observing bison, when we put bulls down, we only field Gilar bulls because I believe the two most stressful things you can do to a bison is take it away from its mom or take it away from its herd. So separating one from the group, uh, I've always found to be too stressful to do. The Native Americans believed if you treated the bison with honor and respect, it would produce an abundance all that's needed and that's part of its sacred medicine. And so part of that honor and respect is, is I'm not going to do something that's going to scare that wild bison who's never been in a trailer, never been on the road, never traveled for 50 minutes to the place that smells like death and then have to wait there to die. So we only field kill our animals. And when we put down young bulls, because they're not established in the pecking order yet, hardly anybody pays attention. Maybe the mom will come over to see why her son went down, but hardly anybody pays attention. If I take one of the competing bulls out of the herd, everybody notices. They all come over. Some of those bulls act like they're putting their last licks on them. I can never tell if they are doing just that, putting their last licks on them, or whether they're just trying to get it to stand up. They work as a herd to protect each other. If I go out to take an animal out of the field, and I just stared at that animal, I'm getting my shot ready. Sorry, bud, you're the guy, right? And I haven't taken the shot yet, but I'm waiting for the steady moment because he's got his head down, he's gonna stand up, and I'm waiting for that moment. Someone will stand in my way. They'll block off. I knew I shouldn't have stared, right? Now, normally, even when I'm handling them, or trying to make them do something for me, I use my own set of push. And staring is enough to make someone move away. They don't, they're a prey animal, they're skeptical. They don't wanna be stared at by anybody, even me, and they know me. So they move away. I've also been out there to take my guy that I have to cull because it's that time. And, uh, and I've watched, you guys all remember, uh, I'm asking for a volunteer. And everybody else steps back except the one guy, because he didn't know everybody else was gonna step back. I've seen it happen with the bison. I've seen him clear the way and give the space. Sorry, it's his turn, right? And the herd is always looking out for itself. It's always watching out. That's why the sickly get pushed to the outside. That's the why the weak are the, the stragglers. When I call from my herd, the first thing I do at the beginning of the season when we're gonna start culling, I'm looking for the guy with the bad eye. I'm looking for the one with the limp that hasn't healed. In fact, since I don't ear tag any of my animals, that's all I look for when I go out to the herd. Who's got the limp? Who's been gored? Who's losing weight? Who's got a bad eye? Those are the ones I keep an eye on. Is it healing? Is it getting better? Or no, it's getting worse. And so we call throughout the year. Uh, because there's always seems to be somebody that's going to be on the outs. Even after you take the last one out, you go a little while, and now there's somebody else on the outs. So we call the sick and the weak first. Then we move on to the two and a half to three and a half year old males. And then if we still needed to call from the herd to knock our numbers down, we might consider a three year old female because she hasn't gotten pregnant yet. So in the, in the natural dynamic of the herd, because calves stay with their moms up to two years, you will not uh, see them get pregnant every year. Most bison get pregnant every other year, and as they get older, and bison can live into their 20s, the oldest bison to give birth was 38 years old, as they get older, it may turn into every third year that that cow may give birth. When uh, she drops a new calf, and she has a two-year-old boy on her still suckling, she will kick him off. 
those boys form a bachelor herd. And for good reason. Uh, they're getting rambunctious. They're learning to push each other around. They can't really learn that from the big bulls because the big bulls are serious about fighting. And they're not going to put up with that nonsense from a young punk coming up. So they punk each other. You know, They learn how to push. And they take turns doing that. And they show off doing that. Um, but they're also in the same boat. Our mothers don't love us anymore because they are all the two-year-olds that were born that same year are in the same boat. And they form that little kind of bachelor group and hang out. When I went up to Fort Niobrara, I saw that on a larger scale myself firsthand uh, because they had a much greater number of animals. Then all of a sudden I come up on the herd and yes, it's all moms and calves from this year and yearlings and some two-year-olds and three-year-olds and, and, and girls up to cow age. And then you, uh, you, had, you had strewn throughout the side a number of young bulls. And then you had, then it was like, well, where's all the big bulls? And we had to go just a little farther and not out of eye shot, probably only another eighth a mile away, were all the big chiefs. And they were all equally spread out around the edge of the herd. With the big guys, I find they reach a detente. It's not like they fight with each other all the time. In fact, they hang out like a boys club, uh, the, big, the big mature bulls, usually with an eye shot of each other. During mating season, they're a little more competitive then. They do push each other around to show off. And I see my large bulls doing what I call figure eights. They kind of walk this figure eight. And they're doing that because they've got two girls by their side. Oh, Frankie, you're so cute, right? And then you also have him looking around to see who's looking at his girls. He's watching the other bulls to see if anybody's eyeing up to come get one of his girls in his harem. You got a, I got a couple big bulls doing that. What I also see is the younger bulls who want to mate cannot go just mate with a female if the mature dominant cows are looking for mature, dominant bulls to mate with, then the young guys are just punks. And they won't, they won't, the mature females won't let them mate with them. But the two and a half to three and a half year old males know who the two and a half to three and a half year old females are in the herd. They all know each other, right? They were all yearlings together and then two year olds together. And so they know the girls that are their age. And, um, Part of why the moms kick those two-year-olds off is they don't want the nonsense that goes with young bulls pushing each other around going on when there are babies on the ground. Because it's going to be seven or ten days before those babies could even get out of the way of someone not a wrestling, putting their heads down and shoving each other around. So it makes a lot of sense that the herd would develop this way. There's an order to things. The girls have a pecking order. And you will see the most dominant female walk up to the dust wallow. And she gets there and she lays down and she rolls a couple times in the dust wallow and she gets up and her calf rolls in the dust wallow right away and then they walk on and then another female comes up and she rolls in the dust wallow and gets up and walks on and another female comes and rolls in the dust wallow and her yearling walks there and then in comes the big bull and he walks up to the dust wallow and at this time, the whole herd is catching up. Now the first animals have already wallowed, and there's still another 40 that want to use that same dust bath. And that big bull comes up, and he lays down there, and he goes, <sighs> and everybody's like, oh, come on, right? They all want to turn in the dust wallow, and he is just laying there doing nothing. And then he gets up, and he paws it a little bit, and he throws himself down. He rolls a couple times, and he... <sighs> And you can see, now the crowd is building around the edge of the dust wallow, and no one's going to push him out. He's the big guy. He can stay there as long as he wants. They're like, they're all, he's hogging the wallow. And finally, he gets up, and he walks out. And another cow walks in and starts to get in the wallow. And just as she's about to roll, another cow comes from the side and chases her out because she was out of order. She was not in line like she was supposed to. And then the cow that chased her out rolls in the dust wallow and goes on. They all know each other in the herd. There is a pecking order, and there is some dominance, and eventually they'll all get to roll in that dust wallow. What's interesting about dust wallows is how integral they are to the prairie. They are the watering fountains that these guys have during wet times in that high ground area when there is nothing to drink. They can walk to that wallow, which was really huge when you had thousands of animals using that wallow every day. 
uh, when there was water in it, they weren't taking a dust bath, of course. They would drink out of that wallow. But you will also th see things like plovers, upland sandpipers, um, various amphibians like toads and frogs that will use that wallow to lay their eggs in and hopefully get those tadpoles to grow to full size and then emerge as frogs and carry their generation on. That doesn't always happen. During dry times, those wallows dry out in a couple days. During wet times, they could stay full for a month and it takes about 21 days for a tadpole to become a frog. So there are a number of different critters that depend on it. Any other critter, the coyotes, the foxes, the badger, they're up there in that high ground, they would drink out of those wallows also. And maybe even a visiting cougar that might wander through the area would find that puddle to drink out of something that would be uh, refreshing. Um, also, when they are rolling in the wallow, um, it removes cockleburrs from their fur. So you can use graphite in a lock to lubricate a door lock. It's a powder. It's very fine, acts as a lubricant. The dust in the dust wallow does the same thing. It loosens the cockleburrs from their fur and it falls out. Um, so you also have uh, them, what they carry off in their fur. If each animal rolls in the dust wallow and carries off half a cup of dirt, over time they actually remove a lot of soil from that spot. Not to mention they continue to pack it down. And so it does uh, create an area that is low and fills with water when it rains and stays full of water for a while. Up here I also have, for you guys to see, uh, this is a beaver skull, this is a prairie dog skull, and this is a groundhog skull. Groundhog is also the woodchuck, and I like this one's my favorite, whistle pig. Uh, old timey name, and as, I, as we talk about old timey names, skunks used to be called polecats, which I also thought is kind of a cool name for a skunk. In front of me, I've got a couple things you probably won't ever see again. Uh, this is a baleen whale vertebrae for size comparison. And that is a whale skull from a pilot whale. So as you look at it, its blowhole is on top. This is its eye socket. Its ear would have been back here. Even though they don't have outward ears, they, they have... Uh, the place where an ear would be, it would be covered by skin and they would be able to pick up sonar uh, sounds in the ocean. This is a bison skin. And I have some bison hair up here. You guys are all welcome to feel it. If you take a clump of the bison hair and put it in the palm of your hands and count to 10, you'll start to feel your hand warm up just by holding it in there. It's got great insulative quality. Uh, the outer edge of the hair are guard, guard hairs, which are straight, and water would have followed that and ran off their coat. On the underside, you can see uh, there would be insulative fluff in between those guard hairs, and the underside looks like a flannel shirt, which is a very tightly woven part of the hair up against the skin. And this, of course, the Native Americans used to keep themselves warm and survive very cold winters here in Kansas. You guys are welcome to take a closer look at that. And um, well, I think that about covers what I have to tell you guys about bison.